other. Now the program tonight can only happen because of the partnership the library has with the Saskatchewan Environmental Society who work very hard to find such great speakers month after month. I invite Nancy from the Saskatchewan Environmental Society to come up and introduce our speaker for the, the night. Good evening. Um, Steve Shirtleaf grew up on a farm in Manitoba and then in the 90s returned to the University of Manitoba for his uh, Masters of Science and PhD. Since then he has been a professor in the Department of Plant Sciences at the University of Saskatchewan. His position involves teaching, research and extension into the areas of crop imaging, weed control and agronomy. Past and current research projects have focused on pulse agronomy, non-herbicidal weed control, as well as phenotypic and agronomic applications of crop imaging using crop imagery. He has a wide range of interests and collaborates widely with computer scientists, plant breeders, geographers, economists, soil scientists, and engineers to form, a dy to form dynamic research groups to tackle interdisciplinary problems. So, welcome Steve. Okay. Thank you very much. So, thanks everybody for coming out on this, yeah, acknowledge this first winter day. I know, uh, I know in my lab, I, got, I had two messages this morning that two people in my lab had been in very, very minor accidents already this morning. One of them, one of them very slowly ran into a school bus. <laughs> I know. And she is, she's a daughter of, she's the, the mother of uh, three children and then another hit a curb and bent his wheel. But nobody was hurt and only the wheel was, the only, only one wheel. So, so thank you for coming out. I'd also like to acknowledge, yeah, the groups for inviting me. It's great to be out. I know a few people in here as, uh, as, fr as friends and people I ski and cycle with as well. So that's kind of great to see. So it's wonderful. Anyways, I'm going to talk to you about sustainable agriculture in the digital age. And that's kind of a, maybe it seems like something that doesn't go together that well. But I, I think first I want to acknowledge some of my co-authors up there. There's Paul Galpern, Sam Robertson, Christy Morrissey. They're partners on uh, the last project I'll show you. But I especially want to mention Tuan Han, Quabina Nikedia, uh, whose pictures are up there. They're two uh, research associates that are in my lab that are absolutely brilliant. And uh, a lot of this very um, technical machine learning work and uh, data processing is uh, is, you know, I can stumble through a little bit of it, but they're the people that take it and run it and run with it. So I really want to acknowledge them as the co-authors. So as Nancy mentioned, I'm kind of, uh, you know, you may be wondering what, if even people like Axel, who I know from Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, may be wondering what the heck is Shirtliff up to? He's a guy <laughs> that does weed control. And I know he used to, he, he did some organic, did some organic, organic agriculture and stuff like that and he's just you know a regular agronomist kind of guy that you know maybe he's more comfortable around a tractor than a computer more or less and you know and maybe that's true and I've spent most of my career looking at uh, well a common theme in my research has been controlling weeds without herbicides and I have pictures here of two uh, herbicide resistant weeds that I've done a lot of work on wild mustard and kochia, which I think everybody must recognize. Even, in, even if you never leave the city, kochia has become a bad weed in the city. I was on campus the other day and a big kochia, about six feet high, <laughs> was tumbling across down the bicycle path and I had to get out of the way of it when it was blew past me. You know, it's, uh, these weeds are truly taking over, but I've done a lot of work in uh, over the years in organic uh, agriculture, some very practical work looking at mechanical weed control and ways of managing, uh, <clears throat> managing competition in order to have the most, uh, have the most uh, um, competitive stand that can, that can still produce yields and did a lot of work in organic lentil and you can see the work we did in it. And, but tonight I'm not gonna talk anything about that because what kind of happened is I got maybe distracted a bit, but I'd done a lot of work in that and I, I think I had come to a point where I'd done a nice body of work and it, you know, I think it, I'd made it a bit of an impact in the community, helping out the farmers. I know, yeah, certainly lentil, organic lentil grow, growers 
a lot of them knew about my work and practice the methods that we used but we ended up buying a drone at one point mm -hmm. and uh you know so i had this this new kind of a maybe a toy of sorts but i'd always been interested in crop imaging and looking at weeds and in fact even during my phd back in the 90s i know we hired an airplane to go to to send it up and to look at to look at um to see if we could identify weed patches from the air with it and you know it was a terrible experience because it took two weeks for it to get up in the air and by the time it was there the everything was out of stage and it didn't end up really working but it kind of exposed us to that so we bought a uav and i got involved with a, a group that, that was phenotyping and i still do this work where we work with plant breeders and we and we <clears throat> we go out and i have a crew you see the one person there the person on the left or no actually no, the main person isn't in there, but I have a uh, but I have a crew that goes out and works with plant breeders and tracks the growth of, uh, of plants with UAV imagery over the year. And we've developed uh, worked with computer scientists and developed workflows. Can you see my mouse on this or? Yeah, I can. Well, there we go. Uh, I, I can't really see it anyways, but we've developed workflows that to extract this imagery and share it with the plant breeders to hopefully allow them to select for for varieties that are more adapted or uh, more adapted or perform better or something like that. One of the one of the things that we did early on in this is I had a, t a student of mine, T. Zhang, who uh, was a PhD student, and we used it to phenotype flowering in in uh, canola. And it was we, the reason we picked that at the time was that it was something that was probably easy to do. You know, it was something, and we also knew that flowering in canola should be related to yield, right? Because one flower on a canola plant makes one pod and that pod uh, fills up. So, and it also been through empirical observation that, you know, we, you know, that the years that the canola flowers early and flowers for a long time, the canola usually tends to yield more. So we tested that and T went out and tested it. And you can see that graph there. We looked at and the boxes we looked at canola and over time we could see that indeed that was that we could characterize and i don't think i put the graph on here showing it but that there was a a reasonable relationship with yield nothing special but again here we're not really talking about sustainability yet but just hold on i'm just taking you a little bit on my journey on how i've got to where we've gotten so i've kind of started doing this imagery stuff but then that got me interested i was you know, I'm not a plant reader, you know, or a plant geneticist like like uh, like uh, your like Axel Diedrichsen, who's in our audience here. And I don't pretend to be one. I'm really an agronomist. I'm interested in what's happening to pl to crops on a vast scale, on the scale across Western Canada. And I realized that okay, these same tools we're using, we could also use them with satellite imagery. And here you can see just a a little. A little movie showing canola blooming through the year and you can see it you can see it kind of turning more yellow and getting and uh and then um uh, then becoming less and around this time it started that it started we are, we're in kind of a a bit of a revolution and that, that it's much easier to get satellite imagery than it used to be so it's uh you can actually get it for free in most cases this actually was a different platform we used it with planet imagery we have a we have a, well, we didn't have to pay for it. We have a research license with them where they give us so much a month. But the idea here was we could look at canola and uh, look at it, but we weren't necessarily interested in the yield as much as how much it varied within the field. So we partnered, and I don't know if you can see it on these maps here, and I'll, where you can see, but you can see there's parts that are darker green and some that are yellow. So there's some, there's places within here that yielded higher and lower. And we want to see, is that associated with areas that, that um, areas that flowered longer, that flowered more intensively and flowered longer. And this is Hansini Fernando. She was a master's student with me, now a PhD student. So her PhD, her master's was looking at this and she used something called machine learning to answer this problem. So instead of just looking at a very direct, well, it is a direct relationship, but instead of putting a model on this where we kind of knew that what is the input and what is the output variables, we knew, 
we, we essentially train the model, and I'll give you, a, a, when I get into this a bit longer, I'll give you a better explanation. But we use we used several different several data sources. We used vegetative indices from several different satellite flights, soil salinity, and topography, and we used that to look at the spatial variability within a field of canola, like how the canola yielded, how the yield varied within each field, and we based this on the yield maps. We used those yield maps to train a model to predict the yield using the satellite imagery. So in this case, we're trying to use satellite imagery, and in this case, soil salinity and topography, to predict what the canola yield was. And we only used the satellite imagery during flowering. And she got a, it wasn't a perfect relationship, but she got a reasonable relationship where we were just using her during flowering. And that was great. We also started doing more of this work, and this is work that I did in collaboration with Preston Sorison, of, uh, who works with Angie, uh, Angela Bedard on the Dean of Agriculture. And what we did in this one, we started to use satellite imagery to estimate soil organic carbon. And how the heck can you do that? How can a satellite tell how much soil organic carbon there is in the field? Well, you can't measure it directly, but what you can do is you can see the color of the field. And you're probably thinking, well, you can't see the color of fields. Most farmers in Saskatchewan are no-till farmers, and there's always crop residue on the, on the soil. But we went back in the satellite archive and used, and used images from the, uh, from the 90s, from the 80s and 90s, when summer fall was still practiced a lot. And using that, we were able to estimate the soil organic carbon and build a whole map, a map of soil organic carbon for all of Saskatchewan with an R squared you see here of 0.71, which is pretty darn good. Uh, initially, we just did it for surface soil organic carbon, and then this one we actually estimated it for the different horizons. And no, we're not actually, we can't, the satellite can't see into the soil, but what it's measuring are is the soil reflectance, but it's also measuring the vegetation that is there, how long the vegetation is, and other factors that are associated with it. So, you know, um, you know places that have more, have a thicker uh, horizon of, so of soil organic matter will grow better vegetation, and that's essentially what we're measuring. But we're able to do that. Well, that was published. Another project that'll probably demonstrate how we use machine learning more is using, uh, is, uh, is our work that we've done using soil, uh, mapping soil salinity using machine learning. And some of you, you can probably see, there we go, how is that? Is that wiggling over on the map? Yeah. Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> I just have a hard time seeing it there. So this is, uh, those of you that go outside, you know, that, that have been traveled through the country, probably notice that Saskatchewan has a lot of saline land. It's often, you can see these white crusts around sloughs etc. And not much tends to grow in these because the salinity gets so high that, uh, that it essentially acts as, a, there's a two ways it acts, it acts as an osmotic, it essentially, because of, it acts as an os. well I don't want to get technical here, My, that's what somebody said to me, remember this is a general audience. <laughs> it essentially, because it's so salty, just as you can not drink salt water and hydrate yourself, Plants are the same way. They can't take up salt water and use it effectively in there because the salt prevents them from doing it. So you tend to get just some salt tolerant uh, uh, plants growing in them. Kochia being one of the main one here. What we wanted to do was to determine, can we map salinity and also kochia here using a machine learning approach, using satellite imagery? What we did with this one is we started, and here are some kochia patches you can see here. It's become a huge problem in, in agriculture production. Kochia is now resistant to most major herbicide groups, including glyphosate. Most of the kochia you find out there now, I believe, is actually res is resistant to glyphosate. So there's many crops that there is no longer an in-crop herbicide available to it. So, you know, from my old perspective, it was always like, oh, it's like, Everybody's an organic farmer. And I always say, well, that's not such a big problem. We figured out ways to control weeds without herbicides, but that's beyond the fact uh, matter here. I think what we're often recommending now is that people go out and mow down these patches before they set viable seeds. But anyways, we want to be able to detect these patches using UAVs and possibly satellites. So what 
we did in this project. We have this UAV. I should have maybe had a video of it flying, although it moves so fast, it's hard to see. It's, it's really, it's a vertical takeoff and landing UAV. And the nice thing about it, compared to most of the UAVs, most of the drones that are out there, is this can do a big area. You can do, uh, you can image a quarter section in about a half an hour with this one, with reasonable pixel size, with pixels about, about two centimeters across on the ground, so you can do it. It's actually, this is actually a picture of the military version of the, of the UAV. It was actually developed as a military drone and they started marketing it as a civilian one as well. You can't buy it anymore. They all went over to the Ukraine for the war. So uh, interestingly enough that they all ended up, they don't, they're just surveillance drones. They don't have bombs on them or anything like that. So they're not designed to kill to kill that. So we went out with this and uh, Sandu and Jap Sandu, a graduate student, has been working hard on this, mapping fields with kosha, mapping fields with kosha with these. And the reason we're mapping it with the drone is because what we want to do is use the, the map that we get of the, from the drone as a way to train a satellite map. We want to use it as a training data because we can only map so many fields with the drone. You go with the drone, you can only, you know, at, at batteries, you know, you can only, in a good day, you can maybe map a section and a half, two sections. Whereas with satellite, we want the ability to do stuff over thousands and millions of acres. So that's what we did in this project. So we went out. We also were looking at salinity. So we partnered with a precision agronomy company, uh, Crop Pro, Corey Wilness's company, Croptimistic it's also known as, and they have a machine uh, called an EM38 and it measures the electrical conductivity of soil by measuring the induction of it, uh, in the induction of it, so uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, so it's a way of, you can measure salinity and we back, we calibrated it to actual soil tests. So we're able to get 34 sites where we measured soil salinity as well. So we wanted to use these, and these are the soil salinity maps that were measured by, by Corey's company using these, where red is more saline and blue is less saline. So we wanted to use these, we wanted to use these as our ground measures and use these to train up machine learning models. So you take the ground data, the reference data, and then you then by comparing it to, uh, by comparing the ground reference data to the satellite imagery, and here we have, here we can see the UAV data of the, of the kosher patches, and we can see here something called a harmonic NDVI. And this essentially fits a harmonic, it fits a wave to the greenness, as you can see, as this gets green throughout the summer and then becomes less green, you can see, in this case, it's just going from green to red. Red means that there's nothing living there. That that is essentially tracking our seasonality of plant growth from just starting to get green in the spring to becoming fully green, a full canopy, and then drying down in the fall. So you can actually, so we modeled that with a wave over time. And by looking, and by looking at these over multiple dates, we're able to, tell what is kosher and what isn't. Well, actually the machine is able to because we don't actually do it. The machine trains the data. We'd say that this is a kosher patch, this is a kosher patch, this is a kosher patch. What is the data that best describes those kosher patches? And if you watch where this arrow is, you'll see, aha, it kind of lines up for a couple of shots there, right? And so the machine uses, uses information like that, then applies it to other ones, and it uses that in multiple, multiple, multiple layers, and that's essentially what machine learning is. It isn't, it's a form of artificial intelligence. It's nothing, in this case, it's nothing diabolical. It's just an efficient way of processing data when you have multiple, multiple uh, layers of data. To do this, we use something called the Google Earth Engine, which is a little bit like Google Earth, you know, with Google Earth or Google Maps, where you can see picture, you can see a satellite image of the Earth, but it is that, it is that times a thousand billion, essentially. Google Earth Engine is a repository for, um, for sat all the remote sensing satellite imagery publicly available and climate data that's ever been uh, gathered on this planet. Google has scraped it into its supercomputers 
keeps it there and you can go there and with a, with a coding interface, you can start to analyze data there. And so here you can see, this is a simple, uh, a simple little one where I've just asked it to go look at the, at the Sentinel-2, the Copernicus Sentinel-2 database between 2016 and 2022 from the months of June, July, and August. And then I got get rid of the clouds. And then I tell it to just give me an average yeah, I tell it to give it the NDVI, and I don't show it here in the code, but I think I did an average. That's the average NDVI for every field. So you can see this, how the average, the average, how green fields are vary spatially within them. That some fields, some that, that places within fields are better than others. Every farmer knows that. You have your good areas and your bad areas within your field, right? So we use that. You can also do machine learning within this as well. And this is what we found out. So these are our UAV or UAV, and you can see the patches here from the UAV. Overlaid on here is where, based on the satellite imagery, where we predicted kosher to be. So we're able to find, oops, we're able to find about, we had an accuracy of about 70% for finding kosher, which we're quite pleased about, considering we're using satellites. We're using satellites to find wheat patches in farmers' fields. The great thing about this stuff is it's scalable. It's as easy to do this on 100 acres as it is to do it on 100,000 acres or a million acres. It just takes a bit more computing power, which is becoming cheaper and cheaper. The salinity results were even better, were even more spectacular. You can see here's our survey of one field showing the pattern of salinity. This is the predicted map. And to predict this map, we left this field out of the training data set. So we did not train with this field at all. So this is without ever seeing this field. This is what the machine learning model predicted for where the salinity would be. And you can see in different fields there, it was doing a wonderful job. So here we have a way of mapping and classifying fields with metrics that are related to their productivity. And um, you probably wonder, what does that have to do with sustainability? Just bear, just hold on a second. It's coming. And here's, I'm just showing these cool graphs, showing you how good our data was. And they look really cool. Quibina just does wonders with the presentations of this. And as I mentioned, I used Google, we used Google Earth Engine for this. And this was, I remember, I still remember the first time I saw a presentation of somebody doing this was Bruno Basso came up from Michigan State University and he started presenting this stuff. And I just went, oh my God, this is it. This is it. I never, it's one of the few moments in my life that I realized, okay, this is what I'm gonna be able to use this. And there's gonna be so many research questions I can answer more, more than for the rest of my life. It has ac it has free, a it's free, has access to greater than 40 years of satellite and remote sensing data, 40 years ago. I was, you know, 40 years ago, I was in, I was, you know, just an undergraduate in university. There's satellite imagery from that. We can look back, like I showed you, look back and ask questions, how land has changed, how, how crops have changed over time, how wild areas have changed over time. Now that we have Sentinel-2 imagery in there, we have a, since 2016, we have a really, some really nice spatially good, uh, uh, imagery in there, you can kind of see these are irrigation pivots. You can see how the, the ten, it has 10 meter pixels. Every five days, the Sentinel, one of the Sentinel satellites come over, and if it isn't cloudy, you get a photograph and you get a image, and within a few hours, it's posted online and you can do analysis on it. There's also climate reanalysis products in there, which means that if you want to know how much it rained in a given spot, over the past 40 years, you can find that data there. So you can suddenly calculate things like, what's, how is the, I won't show you this one, but how is the water use efficiency of wheat production change in Saskatchewan over the last 50 years? You know, so I did, I coded that up in an afternoon and you know, got the answer. I haven't published it or anything. There's also soil moisture products. This is a SMAP, the soil moisture active passive. These are so, surface soil organic, uh, surface soil, uh, products. In this case, this little image here is showing the drought of 2021, how it spread across, how it started, how it started, and then got drier and drier and drier across the prairies over time. These ones aren't as fine as pixels because over time. Here's an example of something here is uh, 
is uh, the Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. Heather McNair, a brilliant scientist with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada out of Ottawa, she devised a method to use radar satellites and to use crop insurance seeded acreage reports and to train machine learning models to use radar sat, which is actually Canadian satellites, along with imagery satellites, to classify the crop type of every field grown for every field that's grown in uh, Western Canada. They've been doing that since 2009. It's about 95% accurate, but in crops like canola, it's probably closer to 98, 99% accurate. It makes mistakes with, with uh, wheat and barley and, and, and oat, you know? And like, you're thinking, but this is a satellite. This is using satellite data. It's able to sense what crop is growing there from uh, to do with the imagery and within the case of the radar to do with the radar satellites I don't have time to get into it, but radar satellites, it works like regular radar. A radar wave goes out and how much it scatters can tell you uh, things about the crop canopy. Okay, I use this thing, I'm gonna take a little side thing here to show you what I have uh, did here. And I'm gonna talk about a Phantomyces root rot. And no, I'm not a plant pathologist, but this is a disease in pea and lentil that affects them and it rots the roots. It's from when you grow Peas, too close, or peas or lentils too close in rotation. And what happens essentially is a, is a pathogen builds up in the soil and can hurt the, hurt it, and hurt the crop. It's a very persistent disease. You need very long crop rotations. This is just peas. Normally with four rotations, we think that four years is enough, but now with the phanomyces, you may need more like eight or even maybe even 10 years if you've had a bad infestation. So you can clearly see it but also soil moisture has an effect on it as well. The pulse growers put out this risk assessment checklist. And while it looks really nice, it's not the kind of thing, if you're a farmer, you're not gonna wanna go through this checklist and go through it and do it, right? But there's certain rules in here. How long has it been since the last, since the last time you grew, you grew uh, peas or lentils? How wet was it when you grew there? when you grew them, uh, was there any damage? Was there any damage, um, uh, et cetera. So we took some of these factors and we coded it up into a simple yield model and came up with a little app that using, powered by the Google Earth Engine, where we essentially, you could go into it, and this is a map of Saskatchewan you can see here. The fields that are white are fields that have never seen a pea or lentil crop during that rotation period from 2006 on. The ones that were green have a light frequency, yellow have a more high frequency, etc. So you can go into this, this is a public app, and you essentially what you do, you can zoom in, you can see the fields that have had a higher incidence of peas or lentil, the ones that have essentially had not as good a rotation probably, and then you can click on it, and then by querying the Google Earth Engine, we're able to it asks you a question, what, what's grown there in 2023? But we're able to give you the crop rotation for the previous from, two, oh, sorry, from 2009 on. In this case, we're saying that you should probably not grow peas or lentils here because it's a high risk of root rot, right? You can go look at another field. This one is only headed two times, but the last one has been only five years away or six years away, so there's a moderate risk. Or if you find one that didn't have any in it, there's a lot less risk. So here we're getting ways of maybe tools, using this for a tool that a producer can uh, improve their crop rotation practices. And yet you think, well, maybe farmers should remember what they grew, but you know, five or six or eight years is a lot. A lot of land has changed hands through uh, buying and selling recently and through in the rental market. Now we are about, I think we're at about 50% rented farmland in Saskatchewan these days. So that land changes hands more quickly, so thing. And interestingly enough, I talked to a, a private insurance company and they're actually using this to, uh, and they're, 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 they, they provide um, net revenue insurance and they're not basically, if farmers have a bad rotation, they don't insure them. Mm -hmm. They're not like, yeah, so they're using it for the hub. But what I wanna talk, spend the rest of my talk talking about is a project that we're working on with, uh, we're, I'm working on, I'll tell you about with the collaborators in a second, but we're looking at using these tools to try to help us find marginal lands in the prairies. Well, why the heck would we do that? 
Well, if you have marginal lands, and maybe there's, well, where these bushes is probably marginal. Maybe that's why it was never broken. Or if you look in the background here, you can see land, that the crop, that there's something else, weeds growing in there, or it's nothing growing there at all. There's probably areas in this field that are not that good, right? That are not that good. And if they're saline areas like we saw before, they're probably areas that most years don't grow much of a crop, yet, because they're lower landscape positions, they probably have, and farmers are going through them and fertilizing them the same as thing else, they probably have a heck of a lot of nitrogen fertilizer in them. And they also probably, that is not being taken up by the crop, they're also probably wetter, so they're probably emitting nitrous oxide. And they could be doing, and they're not making the farmer any money, and they could be doing ecosystem service, right? They could be, there's, there's no reason they should be farmed, those, those, those small parts of the field, right? So this came up the idea, and this was actually Paul Gar Gulper and, and Christy Morrissey's idea. I came into it a little bit later because I had the Lego set that would allow to do all the machine learning and everything. Uh, but the idea was they put together the Prairie Precision Sustainability Network. And the key question here is how does relative crop yield vary within the field as we want to find areas within the field that are lower, that are sub-marginal areas. And the idea being that these lands probably would do better to be converted back to perennial production, right? That they probably have no, they shouldn't be used, if they're not making money for the farmer, if they're not doing any good, they probably would make a thing. You know, our crop rotation footprint is over 70 million acres in Western, Can in Western Canada. Our, our every year, farmers in, in Western Canada seed an area bigger than all of Great Britain. That's all of Great Britain. If you farm every acre in Great Britain, and not just England, Great Britain. So we're talking Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland, you know, uh, Yorkshire, you know, England, the whole works. We seed that every year. If, if only a small portion of that is uh, even if one percent of that is marginal land that's a million acres that we could convert and uh, to better ecosystem function so this is where this is what we're working on right now these are our target regions that were identified they were identified we're working with ducks unlimited too these are also areas that are prime duck habitat so we're working firstly in these areas and so our first net, our first job is we're trying to build a network of growers because we want to find out how the yield varies within these fields. We want to find out how the yield varies. And we have Andrea and Tamara have been out there, out there working hard, going to trade shows, talking to farmers about the Prairie Precision Stability Sustainability Network and getting them to sign up. And they've done a really good job. We have over 60 farms representing over 670,000, two thirds of a million acres between Saskatchewan and Alberta. People like to think that farmers don't care about the environment. That's not true. Maybe some don't care that much, but there's a lot that do. There's a lot that care about the environment. Uh, so, they, so these farms range inside from 900 to 4,500 acres, and we have yield data from one to 15 years. What we get from the farmers is yield maps using combines that have GPS's on them and the combines measure how much the grain what the yield is as they go across the field and you can get a yield map and you can see in this case where it's dark blue it's yielding more and where where it's yielding less I should say where it's yellow it's yielding more if you get those over multiple years like you can see here you can start to get an idea of the stability of the yield and you see some areas like this are low in some years but in other years they're yielding high but there's other areas like these two little dots up on the top here you can see every year those aren't those are yielding low those are not good areas those are marginal areas they're getting marginal yields here so we have these six these farms we're collaborating with Tristan uh, Skolarund of Ag Econ and he's modeling the the, the economic return from these areas and giving these farmers when they provide their when they provide their yield maps giving them an economic report every year showing them what their yield distribution was across that field the spatial distribution of that yield so mo you know so most of the field was yielding you know had a high profit but there's some of the field 
that lost the farmer money. And again, this is in canola, in lentils, and in spring wheat. In fact, in spring wheat, there was obviously this field had a large area that probably yielded zero. In this case, this farmer had, what was it? One and a half percent marginal land in the canola, 5% in lentils, and 9% in wheat. Not all far are all farmers like that? No, this farmer had almost no marginal land, like 0%, 0.2, and 0.3. So it's gonna vary depending upon place. But the idea is that perhaps with this, we can understand it and we can find areas that are marginal and those could be ripe to convert. Well, this is a great, this is a great way, this is a great way of doing it because we're getting real data. But the trouble is Western Canada is a big place and we're just got, you know, we've just got, you know, two thirds of a million acres when we have, you know, close to 80 million acres of total farmland. So to actually map this across the whole prairies, which we are trying to do, or even those focal regions, we have to model, we have to model it. And that's where my group comes in. Well, I should say here first, that the idea being is that these marginal areas could be, then be could potentially converted to, converted to perennial crop production. If they're never making money, if they're never making the farmer money, it seems like a good argument that they could, and it's not gonna be a huge pain for a farmer to convert them to perennial. It could be, it, it does seem to make sense. So that's where my group comes in, and uh, myself and uh, Tuan and Quabina and Hansony, we're looking at using this yield data here, using this yield data to train data from satellites and the different satellites and from other data sources, we take those engineer, like do some uh, magic to the imagery, calculate some derivatives essentially, put it into a machine learning model where it uses these yields, it splits the yields from the yield maps, uses it, trains up a model that uh, is valid with, with uh, yield maps that the model didn't see, and then applies that across larger areas. So we get time series of predicted yields. Then we can use this to predict what areas of the field to have stable, stable low yields, stable high yields, and unstable yields. And what we're looking for is the stable low yields. And then we combine that with economic data, we can produce a profit map, and from there calculate the marginality for large areas. And so we're doing, with this project, we're doing something like, I think, 8 million acres, and, but our goal in the next round is to do all the prairies. To do this, this is no easy feat. This took a lot of work in our lab. One of the first problems we had is if you're doing this on millions of acres, there's no, there's no accurate land border, uh, there's, no, there's no accurate digital record of land borders that exist. Yes, there's the quarter section grid that goes there, but quarter section grids don't line up with the size of the actual fields. And it doesn't take into account the areas that are non-crop, like lowlands and bush and other areas you can see. So we developed a method to do this that we're quite proud of this, to automatically segment the field boundaries. We've been able to uh, code that up and to have a method that I think is, what did we say? What did we say? It's about, uh, no, I think 96 we're 96 percent accurate that's uh, a huge step in that because we have to be able to look inside every field and this allows us to make each field electronically separate a separate field which is very important for doing this kind of work we we're able to do our boundary extraction on all of our areas that we're interested in and then we apply things like the harmonic uh, regression that i showed you before we also have some more complex phenometric models that i won't get into but to be able to essentially for every pixel in that field, and we're doing this on a 10 meter basis. So in this, in this field here, in this field, in this room here, we'd probably have about, I'd say about six pixels, right? <coughs> I would guess maybe, a, maybe four. So there, but so we're at a fairly high spatial resolution. And here's just some, uh, so here's kind of a, this isn't really a fully quantified productivity map, but we'll show it to you anyways. So this is our harmonic map, just showing you the underlay of it. And you can see areas that are probably saline next to this draw here, where there's low crop growth. When we use our models, we can see that we're finding those areas. And this is one at, 
using Landsat data here at a coarser resolution and using the, the newer Sentinel data, being able to calculate those areas that have low growth. So we can apply that to all of our areas and then also use landscape position, like what the topography of it is like. We've uh, accessed some, uh, we have some uh, digital elevation maps from the German Aerospace Program, They're the most accurate DEMs of Western Canada so far. And we're able to classify, is the land, does it, the areas that are high and probably dry and the areas that are lower and probably wetter. And you can see how that varies over a landscape position here and able to classify those. And here's at a finer position. The blue areas are wetter in this one. And you can see, you know, so we can't quite see it in this satellite imagery, but these areas are areas that would get more water and probably have more growth. These get fit back into the model to get our output of the marginality map and we get our relative yield, which we're showing here. We're doing this on six major crops, canola, barley, lentil, wheat, oat, and pea. We're gonna be expanding that to soybean and corn pretty soon. And we're doing this, our goal is to do this for all of Western Canada. Then we have to collaborate and define marginality because we realize that we, we don't wanna be in a place of being the almighty, uh, professors and saying your land is marginal and your land isn't because these are complex decisions. Why a farmer would want to keep farming a specific play, place that maybe is marginal, there's probably reasons that go beyond just the pure economics. Obviously, it's proximity where it is in the field are going to matter. If it's a small little area in the middle of a field, they're just going to go through it, right? They're not going to go around. It's too much of a pain. But if it, and maybe it's something of the aesthetics of the farmer. So Tristan's looking at these external, external, external LDs to try to value them as well. So we're looking at that. And this is the part where my group is going to be looking at. We're going to characterize why are these marginal? Is, are they dry, saline, wet? What is the issue of them? Uh, and uh, our future plans are to support producer to convert and manage these. So this is part of some work, uh, some uh, a proposal we're just applying for right now, actually. So uh, Christy and Paul are going to work with producers to supply to uh, to actually to actually convert some of these places we've identified over these patches to uh, and have a control and look at them for ecosystem service. So to convert them back to perennial production and to look and to monitor them for essentially ecosystem services like pollinators, uh, Paul's a entomologist, greenhouse gas emissions. We have a, a soil scientist working with us. Carbon storage. We think if you're growing something in those areas, they should be able to store a lot more carbon. Christie's interested in the water regulatory services and the habitat for birds. So that's all things that are there. So that kind of wraps up my talk. I said it was going to be 45 minutes and look at that. 